Hey, everyone. Thanks for the intro. It's all true. Uh, my name is Mehdi Milani. I'm here to talk to you about integrating React Native with native infrastructure. And I currently work at Facebook as a React Native engineer, working on doing this exact same thing at Facebook. Uh, the goal of my talk is to show you what it's like integrating React Native into an already successful native app, and some things you should think about along the way, some trade-offs. Uh, this is a brief outline of what I'll be talking about. First, I'll start with uh, just a little status update from React Native at Facebook, what we're doing with it. Uh, discuss like what a fully React Native app is versus a hybrid app. Then discuss a few concepts of integration points, like navigation, data loading, and experimentation. Then lastly, I'll uh, give you a quick little guide of when it makes sense to use React Native and when it doesn't make sense. All right, let's start with React Native at Facebook. So as you may know, uh, we have three main apps built in React Native. On the far left is Ads Manager. It was our first project like three years ago, entirely built in React Native. And then the main app, uh, Parts of it, are built in React Native as well. And lastly, the newest one, Instagram, also has some parts built in React Native. It's currently used like, by uh, hundreds of product engineers, so that kind of scale. We also have hundreds of screens in the main Facebook app built in React Native. And like, we're still just really chugging away, still working on it, still contributing back to open source. Everything's going pretty great. We we'll just keep working on it. All right, let's get to more interesting content. Uh, let's talk about fully React Native apps versus hybrid apps. So this distinction is important when you're considering uh, integrating apps and what that really means. So on the left, again, we have Ads Manager. That's what we call a fully React Native app. Um, all of it's built in React Native, even like the tab bar, the navigation, all that stuff is controlled through React Native. On the other hand, we have the Facebook app. This is a hybrid React Native app. So like the tab bar isn't really in React Native, and the search bar isn't either, but the main content here, like the marketplace screen, is all built in React Native. For this talk, we're thinking about hybrid React Native apps. This is where you start to integrate React Native into an already successful app. And the first main thing that people think about is navigation. Uh, navigation, simply put, means going from any two screens in your app. They could be you know, native to React Native, React Native to React Native, React Native to Native, any of that sort of integration points. Uh, when you're first thinking of how to bring React Native into your app, you're probably just imagining that you'll use JavaScript to do all the navigation within the React Native part. But you end up with all these bigger questions that come out of it, like, how do I navigate to a native view from this React Native one? And then how do I deal with uh, you know, the trans trans uh, transitions between my two React Native screens? Do I just like, rebuild that same transition and hope that it matches a native one? Also, uh, the native navigation stack actually has some pretty good features. Things like Peak that lets you uh, hold going back, and then it'll show you like, the underneath screen below what you're looking at. That's a pretty cool native feature, and it's be hard to rebuild that in React Native, especially when you're going back and forth between native and React Native screens. The end result of all this is that we just reused the native navigation stack, and it made a lot of sense for us because of these main reasons. Uh, reusing it, the model we settled on is having uh, unique URLs for each screen. Whether it's a native screen or a React Native screen, we just had a unique URL for it. So here in this example, I just have like two basic uh, URLs. This model worked really well for us for a bunch of reasons. Uh, you can see in this way, or in this scheme, how parameters are passed over. They just like, you know, if you have a product ID or something, it turns into a query parameter on the URL, really simple. Notably, it's uh, really easy to encode a URL as well. It's not some like special route scheme or anything that might be hard to serialize and might not be clear if it's even serializable from JS, but URLs are obviously just strings, real great for that. Uh, really good for debugging too, right? If you like see a log output and you see a URL, you know it corresponds to a screen, you can easily plug it in somewhere else, open up that screen. Uh, in this model, each React Native screen is its own root view, and because of that, it actually makes it really easy to handle React Native Redbox or Fadals. Because we already have this like stack set up, and say one of the screen uh, runs into a red box, we can reload that screen with the same URL, and then you're sort of at the same place that you were before, maybe not the exact same place, but close to where the user was before, so they can try that action again, and hopefully it works. Just to put it a bit more concretely, this is what an example navigation looks like. So on the left side, we have a native screen. Let's say there's some button there that we tap, opens a product. It turns into a URL with the product ID passed into the URL. That goes into our URL handling code, and that code knows how to open a, a screen based on its URL. So it knows that it's a React Native screen, knows the URL, and then opens it. That's pretty simple, a pretty simplified view. Uh, you run into some other problems, though. For instance, how do I tell my code that the screen I want to open is actually a modal? 
It doesn't want to be pushed on normally. It wants to be like a modal thing. Or maybe like the title has to be something specific. Or maybe I don't want a back button. I want to put like an X there instead. How do I do these things? The way we did this is with a thing simply called navigation options. <laughs> pretty boring title, pretty boring thing. Uh, it's really just a big hash on all of, our, all of our screens, the object's property. In this hash, we can specify things like transition, the allowed orientations. Uh, you can even control like the Chrome that you see. So for instance, like the bar button should be like a back button. How should the top right button be handled, if it even should be there. Uh, you can also specify things like the title. And they can all be specified by the URL parameters, more interestingly. So for instance, say you're opening a product page, and you actually want the title to be uh, the actual product title, you could put that into your URL, and it can pop out and then be show up on the screen properly. Now, this is kind of important because the JS runtime isn't actually running necessarily when you open a JS screen. So we have to have some way of getting to these uh, navigation options without the screen, without JS already be running. And this is the big issue we ran into. Like, how do you find out the navigation options for a screen if JS isn't open yet? Our solution is kind of hacky, but kind of awesome. And we actually just code gen all of our routes into this big JSON file. So we take our navigation options, all specified on the app classes, have this cool JS script that like requires them all, does some like cool sanity checks, you know, make sure if you're specifying iOS or Android that the navigation options match what it, make, what it should be. Then just writes this to a big JSON routes file. And finally then, our native URL handler can read the JSON routes file at runtime without needing the JSON VM. That's really great. Uh, you can just start up your screen with the right transitions, not having to do any jankiness. Uh, back to our little like, diagram of how it works. You can see here I just added this huge JSON guy in. It comes from our app file, our JS files, at, at compile time, but then at runtime, the URL handler can read them in and know what to do. Cool. Uh, next, I want to talk about data loading. So we ran into a couple of main concerns when we thought about data loading. Data loading here is just loading the regular data for your screen, whether it's a product, whether it's a, a user's list or something. There's a few things we were really concerned about. One is consistency. Uh, the data throughout your app should be consistent. Whether it's on a native screen or a React Native screen, the data should be the same. If the user likes a status or you know, deletes something from their list on the native side, it should look like that on the React Native side. There shouldn't be any disparity. It'll just make them question what's going on and if their action really happened. So we wanted to make sure that our data was consistent no matter how it worked. And whatever our data loader was it had to be accessible from both native and React Native. We were also concerned about over-downloading. Uh, imagine if you like, are loading images, and on the native side it downloads it, and on the React Native side it downloads it again without going through cache. That would really suck. Like, what if this user's on a data plan and they're like, using up their megabytes? That'd be really bad. So we really wanted to avoid over-downloading content. Lastly, we have this other mega idea called data prefetching. This is pretty cool. The whole idea here is like, what if we could fetch the content before the React Native screen actually shows up? The reason that we thought about this, you've probably haven't seen this before, but a React Native screen startup time can be pretty bad. It can be split into two parts if the React Native screen hasn't, or React Native hasn't even been initialized yet. You have like the bridge startup, starting up the whole JS bridge. That turns into like the native modules happening, and then finally parsing, running the JS. And then your whole app startup. This is all the JS code running. You know, at first you have the requires, then you have your network fetch, then your JS render finally, and then finally the native render turning into actual views. Our main idea here was that if we knew what the screen would uh, need to load, right when the user taps a button to open that screen, we can just load that content. That way, uh, when the JS eventually wants to do the network fetch, we'll already have the content there and it can skip immediately to rendering it, and we'll get a much quicker load. So simply, it just turns into this. Pretty great, we do it in parallel, and by the time uh, JS is running, we already have the content and can render it. it saves us a lot. Uh, this is the three main reasons why we settled on doing a native data loading model, where we just have a native data fetcher, and also the single source of truth, that we have great consistency for it, and it really solves a lot of problems, problems in that direction. Uh, the last thing I wanna talk about is experimentation, and this I mean stuff like feature flags or A-B testing. Uh, again, similar theme here, the main concern we have is consistency. It'd be really bad if in native land you thought the user was in some feature flag, but in React Native you didn't. You could run to all sorts of crashes and real bad problems and bad experiences from that. Uh, the solution is pretty simple, and it's kind of the same solution you adopt in regular native apps. We just load all the experiments at startup and then reuse those for the entire app session. Uh, that means when React Native is loaded, because it might not be at startup, it could be later on when they navigate to your view, we reuse those same values. 
Uh, and again, if you're like a bit concerned about data loading here being too much, maybe you have some important data stored in your experiments that isn't necessarily uh, needed at start time. You can do a similar thing like navigation and uh, find all the usages of the experiments and load those at the right time. You can also do things like caching on the server their session and then loading them then. Uh, yeah. The important thing here, uh, or one kind of disadvantage of this system actually, is that if you t tweak a feature flag on the server, it could take a while for users to actually get that new feature because the app session could be long lived. Uh, we there could be like some tricks here. Maybe if you're trying to tweak a feature flag to like solve some crasher, you can maybe have like a kill switch. We'll just like force quit the app and let them reopen it to get the new feature in. Um, but that's like the main concern. It's a one thing you already run into on native apps. All right, the last thing I want to end with is a quick guide for you on when you should use React Native in your own app. This is like, in the, again, of the idea where you have a hybrid app, you already have your successful native app, and you're thinking about using React Native in it. So it's really great for new features. Um, if you have a new feature that requires a lot of design iteration, even better. We found that designers really enjoy how when they're working with an engineer on a React Native feature, the React Native engineer can iterate on both iOS and Android at the same time and quickly get feedback on how it feels, how it works, and then go from there. Um, it's not really the same with us for native because you might have different people with different timelines working on the iOS and Android part. So really great for design iteration, heavy design iterative features. Also really good for full screen views. Um, the hybrid one I showed before, that's what I kind of mean by a full screen view. I'll get more into that a bit later. Um, also, oh, web view conversions, great use case as well. Maybe you have like a help center or something that's all powered by web views now. Really great case to move it to React Native. Feels much better, feels much more native. And you can even have a dynamic data loading and doing some templating to render content. All right, and the stuff it's not that great for, it's not good for like small view embedding. My, my idea here is maybe you have like a small banner somewhere in the app and you're thinking about powering that with React Native. That might not make much sense because you know, when you're on the other screen where you want to show the banner, maybe it's an entirely native screen, and then you have to load the whole JS VM just to show this banner, that could be like a long start time. It might be too heavy for what you want. Um, also, if you're doing like a mega rewrite, that's going to be the exact same app, like look and feel the same, but you're doing a React Native, that's not really a great use case, not good use of your time in my opinion. I mean, if you're going to spend a month doing that, you could just a do a month on iterating in new features instead in React Native. That'd be way more valuable for you. Uh, I should say like, this is not a super hard category. Like, I'm sure we have some small views in our app that are React Native, but this is a general guideline to follow maybe when you're thinking about your own React Native app. Anyways, that's all I want to talk to you about. Thanks for listening. My name is Mehdi. Uh, I'll be around later. Feel free to chat me up. And uh, that's my email if you have any other questions. Thanks so much.